excited to tell you about uh, the work that we've been doing, which um, is really, what I'm going to show you is kind of the, uh, our latest milestone in, um, in trying to understand how synapses work. And um, I, I'm very, very happy with uh, where, where we're at at the moment with this and, and the promise that the future holds for where we're going to go. So our, our motivation uh, behind our work is uh, ever since I was a little boy, I wanted to know how the brain works and especially how synapses work in the brain since I think um, that's where the rubber meets the road in understanding how the brain computes. And in order to understand um, how synaptic structure and function are related, um, we need to know the topolo uh, topology of synaptic uh, structure and the perisynaptic space around synapses um, because they're not uh, bottled up little compartments. They're actually open to, in, through the extracellular space uh, to, other, you know, to the other uh, neurons in the brain. Um, that means we need to understand neuropil. Um, and I put three exclamation points after neuropil. You'll see why in a minute. I'm sure a lot of you are already um, have a fear of neuropil, as I do. Um, we need to know the organization of the pre- and postsynaptic uh, cytoplasmic organelles and the distributions of receptors, ion channels, enzymes, and transporters, et cetera, throughout these structures um, because the biochemical reaction networks and their dynamics um, are occurring in um, space that is not well mixed. and um, 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 the numbers of molecules can be very small in, in synapses, as um, uh, Avrama uh, told you earlier, the number of molecules in a spine head um, is, can be very, very small, and so the reactions occur stochastically, and so we have to understand um, how um, they interact with each other um, stochastically, and so the simulators that we use to simulate these things have to be able to um, not um, shy away from these things, but embrace these things and tackle them head on. So um, I have a little cartoon here that shows um, 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 how influx of presynaptic calcium causes release of neurotransmitter into the synaptic space, activating receptors, and then all the postsynaptic um, downstream um, um, uh, chemical, biochemical cascades that uh, Kim told you about um, occur. And also there's spillover of neurotransmitter into the exhalator space uh, to possibly activate uh, synapses on, a, on adjacent um, dendrites or, this, or synapses of the same dendrite and reuptake of neurotransmitter by astrocyte, um, possible uh, activation of other uh, biochemical processes in the astrocyte itself and, of course, in the target uh, dendrites. And uh, this little cartoon um, gives you an idea of, of um, the spatial arrangement of, and, on, and numbers of different types of molecules that um, we'll be talking about in the simulations that I'm going to show you. Um, I'm going to show you um, the construction of a realistic model of synapses in hippocampal neural pill. Um, the simula simulation is going to include all of these uh, different molecules, um, um, their locations in space and their uh, correct densities and uh, biochemical reaction uh, interaction networks. Um, and I'm going to walk you through um, one by one uh, each of these as we put the model together. Um, to construct a model like this, we need constraints. Um, you'll hear tomorrow um, in one of the workshops um, um, the topic uh, model what you can measure. So that's precisely what uh, we're attempting to do here, but at the molecular um, and reaction pathway level um, at, at uh, tiny structures. So. Um, we were able to obtain, uh, through our collaboration with Kristen Harris, um, a, uh, a 3D reconstruction of a 6 by 6 by 5 micron chunk of hippocampal CA1 neural pill from an adult rat in stratum radiatum. Um, this uh, little uh, chunk here was chosen 
by Kristen to be centered on a part of a primary apical dendrite. Um, there were 100 slices, uh, 50 nanometers thick in the reconstruction to give us the uh, five microns uh, in total in, in Z, and we have six by six microns in X and Y. And here's the entire uh, structure reconstructed, uh, viewed from the outside in. Um, um, the yellow represent dendrites, the green represent axons, and the blue is um, an astrocytic glial uh, process. Um, it's, it's all a, a big tangled mess. I have an animation um, that I won't have time to show you, um, but it's available on YouTube. Um, if you go on YouTube and type in Waltz and Hippocampus, um, you'll, it, it should be the top hit, and you can uh, watch um, uh, a movie that our, our uh, postdoc student, uh, Justin Kinney, put together as part of this uh, thesis project to study spillover of glutamate. And uh, he has a paper that recently came out in Journal of Comparative Neurology um, on this topic. Um, and um, I have a, but I do have a, a shorter movie showing the dynamics in that structure coming up in a moment uh, that will give you some appreciation for the internal structure of that. Um, but part of the challenge that Justin faced in putting this together was um, the fact that um, it's well known that there um, are shrinkage artifacts that occur during um, tissue fixation uh, in uh, pre preparation of samples for um, uh, TEM. And also there are um, numerous um, sampling alias arti aliasing artifacts that occur during the uh, re reconstruction process itself of trying to go from um, uh, s slices that you, wh where a human being or a machine learning algorithm draws a contour. Um, machine le learning algorithms aren't nearly up to the task of, of fully automating this, so a human being uh, needs to uh, assist and uh, the machine assists and the, and the human finishes the job of tracing all the structures. But um, because of the limited Z resolution, when you reconstruct, if we take this and cut it in the XZ plane, uh, uh, so now the Z axis is going downward through, and if we look at this little box here and magnify it on the screen, this is the raw reconstruction that results. You'll see places where the extracellular space is very narrow or even occluded. Um, places where uh, structures actually touch and overlap with each other. This is not a problem with the traces that were drawn. This is a problem that occurred because of aliasing of, of sampling in the z direction, sampling at a, at a limited uh, stepwise um, resolu resolution results inevitably, um, unavoidably results in these artifacts. So Justin was able to write an algorithm that uh, um, corrected these errors and got back to an extracellular space volume fraction that is thought to be the same as what occurs in vivo of about 22 percent ECS fluid. Um, here in the raw reconstruction, not, not counting the, the overlaps, which obviously are completely wrong, um, the extracellular space volume fraction here was only 8 percent. Having made those corrections, we now have a proper geometry for performing our, our uh, simulations in. We then need the constraints of all the reaction pathways and, and chemical kinetics for all the different molecules that I showed you on previous slides. Um, we have uh, uh, glue R1 type amper receptors, N2RA and B type NMDA receptors, LRPQ type voltage de uh, dependent calcium channels. Um, GLT-1 and GLAST glutamate transporters, PMCA, NCX, and circa pumps, endogenous uh, calcium binding proteins of some unknown generic type, and uh, specific calcium binding proteins uh, such as calbindin D28K. We also have um, the chemical kinetics scheme and kinetic rate constants for 
the calcium sensor in the snare complex that results in release of neurotransmitter. Um, th this uh, diagram has uh, 36 different states in it, um, um, a release enabled state and a release disabled state for the entire uh, active zone and each, each docked vesicle in the active zone um, and of which on average there's maybe seven docked vesicles at a hippocampal uh, presynaptic terminal. Um, each um, docked vesicle has, one, has a molecule that behaves like this uh, in it, but they're coupled together through uh, an interesting mechanism. The release disabled states of all the docked vesicles in a single active zone are coupled together uh, through, uh, th through this state so that the uh, state of the entire active zone behaves like one macromolecular complex. Um, each one can be in 30, each, each individual docked vesicle is, one of, is in one of 36 different states and if there's seven docked vesicles then we have um, 36 to the seventh power different states that the, that the entire active zone can be in at any one time. This is one example of combinatorial explosion um, uh, of which Chemkinase 2 is an even more extreme example. Um, um, uh, the other molecule, important molecule that I'm going to show you in the simulation is um, uh, uh, molecules are calmodulin and chemkinase 2, which uh, calmodulin binds calcium. And um, when it does, it can bind to uh, chemkinase 2. Um, calcium binding to, to the chemkinase 2 um, undergoes these state changes to be in any one of these nine different states. And when the chemkinase 2 is bound calcium, it can, um, it can bind um, uh, kinase K, represented as K here, to form uh, a complex with chemkinase 2 monomer is shown here. The, um, of course, the holoenzyme uh, consists of 12 subunits in a complex. And so now take this uh, to the 12th power and then not counting the phosphorylation states that it can be in. Um, if we count all those, the uh, chemkinase 2 holoenzyme can be in any one of, uh, say, 10 to the 16th different possible states, possibly more. And so um, traditional modeling uh, methods using uh, differential equations uh, and even the Gillespie algorithm where it's required that you calculate a propensity function require that you map out um, a matrix, uh, say in, in an ODE or PDE method, you have to map out a matrix um, that represents your, your system of simultaneous uh, differential equations and then um, diagonalize that to find the eigenvalues in order, uh, and you have to do that on every time step to move forward in time in order to get the, how the concentrations uh, or numbers of particles update on each time. Um, uh, simulating uh, a molecule like chemkinase 2 or the uh, active zone is pro prohibitive, prohibitively expensive and even intractable. Um, 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 fortunately, we use uh, M cell, um, uh, which is a particle based method that tracks uh, individual molecules uh, through space and time, and each molecule is, in only, is only in one state at any one moment in time. Um, and it models uh, 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 3D reaction diffusion systems. Um, it uses rigorously validated and highly optimized stochastic Monte Carlo methods to track the Brownian dynamics of individual particles um, in 3D volumes and 2D surfaces embedded in 3D. We, as you uh, have seen of uh, the 3D reconstruction that we've made, we can handle arbitrarily complex 3D geometry. Um, we don't create volumetric meshes, we make triangulated surface meshes um, because we track the particles where in, in 3D space, each particle knows where it is in 3D space, we don't need to a voxelized space, um, which is a, um, uh, can have a large advantage in simulating complex uh, geometries. And as I've alluded to, we can handle arbitrarily complex reaction networks. Um, we do this by using either a Markov or a rule-based specification method. Uh, Mar a Markov method would require you to write down all the, all the states and all the 
all the pathways. That would be prohibitively expensive uh, with a um, something like the active zone or CAM kinase 2. Um, but with a rule-based specification method, you just write down the rules that govern how the, the state transitions occur, and those rules are evaluated on the fly um, as the simulation runs particle by particle. So each particle only needs to know wh what state it's in and what rule applies for um, its transitions to its adjacent states, and you only evaluate those rules on a particle by particle basis, which is very efficient. Um, and this is all possible with a highly flexible model description language that MSOL employs. And we have a new model building and visualization and analysis, analysis environment that allows uh, the user to create all these things visually in a 3D modeling environment based on Blender. And um, it's a Python plugin for Blender called Cell Blender. And now I'm going to show you an animation that represents um, many, many, many years of effort of many, many, many people working together. Um, and I'm very proud of, when I'm, of, of this. I think you'll, you'll enjoy it, too. So what you're looking at is a, um, that large apical dendrite, um, a single axon making a, contact, a snap to contact here and there with this dendrite. The blue represents the astrocytic glial process of a single astrocyte embedded in this volume. The axon has been made transparent so that you can see inside of it. Um, you can see it has endoplasmic reticulum going through. Here's a, here's a mitochondrion in one of the um, varicosities. We're going to zoom in on this particular one. The red patches on the dendrite represent um, um, synaptic contact areas. All the other dendrites and axons that you saw earlier are, are made invisible here so that we can see what's going on. The little yellow particles moving around are calcium. This is what 100 nanomolar calcium looks like at rest. These are synaptic vesicles. We have AMPA and NMDA receptors on the postsynaptic side. This is a small patch of voltage-gated calcium channels on the presynaptic side. The little gray particles on the surface of the membrane here are PMCA pumps. The little green particles on the endoplasmic reticulum are circuit pumps. Uh, we're now stimulating the axon with uh, an action potential. It, it turns a brighter shade of green as we do. And the voltage-gated calcium channels open and allow calcium to flow in. When the calcium flows in, it starts to build up. I want you to notice how, how tightly contained and how focused the um, calcium microdomain is, nanodomain is. These little red uh, uh, objects here represent this, the um, uh, snare complex uh, release mechanism that, in a moment, is going to bind enough calcium to cause release of the neurotransmitter. And right about now. Right there, we've released about 2,000 molecules of glutamate that diffuses through the extracellular space. And when it does, it spreads out very quickly, but also activates AMPA and, and NMDA receptors within the um, uh, postsynaptic uh, patch of, uh, on, on the spine head. But the glutamate also diffuses outward and binds to glutamate transporters on the astrocyte, which are invisible until in this visualization until they bind glutamate, and which time they turn red. And the glutamate gets quite far and persists for quite a, quite a large amount of time. Oh, this is the wrong, <coughs> this is the wrong animation. This is what you're doing. Uh-oh. This is the wrong animation. It doesn't have the post first. Uh-oh. I'm going to. It's OK. It's good. No, it's not. <laughs> it's because you're done. It's not good enough. Uh-oh. How did that happen? Anyway, I, it, it didn't show, it didn't, it was the wrong one. I apologize. Um, and in closing, <laughs> the one I wanted to show you then also shows um, uh, activation of the NFDA receptors and influx of calcium into the postsynaptic spine head and activation of cam kinase 2 and calmodulin um, going out to 100 milliseconds. Of, of time, and uh, somehow I put the wrong one in there. Um, but I want to thank all our collaborators who have worked with us over the years uh, on putting this together, especially um, friends uh, no longer with us. Um, thank you.